if you had to work more than one job to have a roof over your head or food on the table, you probably shouldn't have taken the job that's not paying you enough. That'd be a you problem. You gotta get up, you gotta get to work, you gotta get going. Something I always tell people to do instead of going out and protesting, Jesus, I just can't Cleaning stand Cleaning up that. the room? Yeah. What do you think? It's gonna work. <laughs> You're exactly the kind of man I'd be looking for. I've never had a negative interaction with a female ever. Whatever, I don't know what you can do that's legal and moral, but I want you to go make an extra two or three thousand dollars a month. But you don't have no life. You can't breathe. You're so tired, your your nostrils hurt. I do think I win because I outwork people. I really do believe that. Not a single woman has accused me of rape, not a single woman has come out and said anything from my entire past of 36 years I've done anything wrong ever. Hi everyone, and welcome to this month's video essay here on the financial diet. I am your host, Chelsea Fagan. And pull up a chair. In fact, let's go camp counselor and flip that chair around and sit on it backwards because we need to have a bit of a rap sesh about masculinity. Because when it comes to masculinity in America, we are in a bit of a flop era. You might have heard this already, but there is an epidemic of male loneliness in this country, with fewer men than ever reporting having close friendships, and many of the institutions that men have historically relied on to form social connections all but disappeared. Quote, men in today's society may view deep relationships as not masculine, thus further isolating themselves. Only 48% of men reported feeling satisfied with friendships, according to a May 2021 survey, as previously reported by CNN. And one in five men said that they had gotten emotional support from a friend in the past week, compared with four in 10 women. And many experts have also referred to the growing mental health issues with men in America as a silent crisis, something that's exacerbated by their overall resistance to seek health care of any kind, even compared to women with the same income. Quote, according to the CDC, 26% of men have not had an appointment with a health care provider of any kind during the last 12 12 months. The Men's Health Network attributes this to the fact that many men are raised from an early age to believe that strong men don't cry, don't complain, and aren't ill. Men are taught these things all represent weaknesses and that real men are strong. Before we get into this month's video, I wanted to take a second to give a huge thank you to our sponsor, Betterment. With over three months still left in the year, I know that some of you guys are probably still thinking about all of those money intentions you set all the way back in January. And if making big money moves was on your list, the good news is there is still plenty of time to accomplish those goals before the year ends. And Betterment makes it easier than ever to start investing no matter how much you're starting with. All you have to do is choose one of their expert-built ETF portfolios and you're automatically diversified across multiple stocks and bonds at once. Plus, their automated investing tech and tax-smart tools are designed to help you maximize your returns. One of the most important things you could do when it comes to investing is start as early as possible so your money has plenty of time to potentially grow. Now is the time to make sure you tick off your 2024 money goals. Head to betterment.com slash TFD or click the link in our description so you can start putting your money to work and your mind at ease. And thanks to our sponsor, Factor. It's finally the end of summer, RIP, which means that a lot of us are finding ways to settle into better routines. If you're struggling to find the time or energy to cook for yourself, but don't want to sacrifice on the food quality or nutrition, you need to check out Factor. Factor meals let you skip the overpriced takeout trap. Factor is cheaper and way more delicious since their meals are fresh, never frozen. Get chef-crafted, restaurant-quality meals delivered right to your door. They're ready to heat and eat in just two minutes, which means more time for you. And when things get hectic, Factor is flexible. Change your order up every week with plans from 4 to 18 meals per week, or pause or reschedule your delivery deliveries anytime. Our creative director, Holly, has been loving her Factor meals. I'm always trying to eat more protein and I'm loving how much my Factor meals make this so much easier. It means way less meal planning on my end and tons of time saved and I'm still eating well. I especially loved the tofu enchilada bowl and the creamy pesto pork chop. So head to factor75.com or click the link below and use code TFD50 to get 50% off your first Factor box and 20% off your next month of orders. That's code TFD50 at factor75.com to get 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next month of orders. To give us more insight on the epidemic of male loneliness, toxic masculinity, and how manosphere gurus are selling out men, we spoke with Neil Sheminsky, a gender and media studies professor. There is absolutely a connection between toxic masculinity and male loneliness. Um, I think one of the surest reasons that this is true is that um, loneliness 
you know, this epidemic of loneliness, crisis of loneliness, whatever we choose to call it. The, the factors that reduce these situations, work culture, uh, technology, more of us working from home, telecommuting than ever before, capitalism in general, um, they impact women too. You know, uh, it's not as if um, men are um, unique in some way in living alone, um, being single, um, you know, having uh, social networks, support networks that are um, at a distance. This, this affects women in nearly the exact same numbers. Um, so what then is the difference between men and women here? Um, and I think that masculinity is the best explanation that we have. Um, that you know, privileging of stoicism, silence, um, an aversion to sharing feelings, a desire to not burden other people with your problems. Um, these are all celebrated within a culture of masculinity and toxic masculinity, especially. We also spoke with Katrina Montan, a PhD candidate at Columbia University and organizational consultant. In terms of thinking about, um, you know, traditional or toxic masculinity and male loneliness, I, I think I would put it in like maybe three buckets or categories. So I think the first would be, you know, a key tenet of traditional or toxic masculinity, however we want to call it. Um, you know, is emotional restraint. So I think men are often socialized to hide kind of their vulnerabilities and avoid showing emotions, which I think can prevent them from seeking emotional support. I think vulnerability is a very important component to developing meaningful relationships and connections with others. And so in some ways, if men are completely suppressing those parts of themselves, I think it becomes really challenging um, for them to connect in real ways with peers, partners, families, right? So I think um, what we see then is, you know, this emotional suppression can directly block men from actually forming meaningful relationships with other men um, and, and women as well. And if we're looking at ways to identify the flop era that men are in right now, few indicators are more striking than the decrease in life expectancy, again, even compared to women. Because over the past few years, life expectancy generally has taken a bit of a hit due to the COVID pandemic. But even within that phenomenon, there seems to be pretty notable differences, both between men and women and between Americans and the rest of the developed world. Quote, between 2019 and 2021, the life expectancy in the United States dropped from 79 to 76 years. But men have died of COVID at a higher rate than women. The reasons for this are complicated. Biological factors like differences in inflammation and immune responses likely played a significant role. But social and behavioral differences mattered too. Men are more likely to work in industries with higher rates of COVID exposure and fatalities, including transportation, agriculture, and construction, or to experience incarceration or homelessness. Women are also more likely to be vaccinated. Now, with all that being said, I want to say two things very clearly before we dive into this video. First and foremost, I am not here to in any way make light of these issues or to diminish them against other issues which may be worse. It can be perhaps sometimes a trendy position on the internet to make light of issues that face men, especially straight men, and to treat them with a certain level of flippancy, whether because they're not as acute as other problems or because it's undeniable that men do still hold a number of privileges in our society Society, which make it theoretically easier on the individual level to confront some of these issues. But I know that no one is a statistic and we are all individuals, and that just because someone else might have a broken leg, your sprained ankle still matters. But second, and maybe even more importantly, this is first and foremost a financial channel. So I want to explore this issue from a financial and economic perspective. Because when you look at the trends in our economy over the past few decades, things like the decline of unions, stagnation of wages, and concentration of wealth, at the very top income levels, you can see extremely strong correlations with the trends of issues that men are facing. The same issues that a lot of these gurus we're going to discuss today are happy to sell you solutions to at an expensive price while completely ignoring the economic elephant in the room. So we're going to be taking these problems seriously, but we're also not going to be scapegoating them by blaming people who are also victims of these same economic trends. In this house, it is not enough to just say, oh, women are
are now working all day and not taking care of the home anymore, and that's why men are sad. We are going to dive deeper and ask why so many parents are in the workplace to begin with, working full-time while also trying to be full-time parents and drowning in the cost of childcare, and why it's no longer realistic for the vast majority of American families to survive on a single income the way we used to. So put on your nuance hats and let's get ready to unpack the crisis that is being a man in America. Starting with chapter one, grind culture and the pressure to provide. Basically anyone can tell you that historically one of the core tenets of masculinity, pretty much cross cultures, has always been the ability to provide for a family. For millennia, and certainly for many decades before us, the model was traditionally one of men are the providers and women are the homemakers. And even leaving aside the many ways in which that very model can be complicated in and of itself, and definitely wasn't always as simple as we like to think it was looking back in history, providing in and of itself is inevitably a source of stress, because it's a huge expectation to live up to. And a large part of this is because it's become all but impossible to support a family on a single income anymore. Thanks to wage stagnation, the middle class is shrinking and the income gap is widening to levels we haven't seen since the Gilded Age. In 1970, adults in middle income households accounted for 62% of aggregate income, a share that fell to 42% in 2020. Meanwhile, the share of aggregate income accounted for by upper income households has increased steadily, from 29% in 1970 to 50% in 2020. And this is an especially big problem when we tell men that they are worthless if they don't have money and power. I, I think the constant push to work harder, longer, can lead to, lead to severe physical and mental problems like chronic stress, burnout, insomnia, heart disease. Um, and I think men caught up in this grind culture may neglect their health in favor of work, um, which again, we, we as we just mentioned, can lead to long-term consequences. I think the emphasis on work often means less time for family, friends, and hobbies. So I think um, family and friends, like on this first front, I think this can strain your personal relationships. So as men may be physically present, um, but emotionally unavailable, kind of the lack of quality time with loved ones could lead to isolation and honestly dissatisfaction with their personal lives. And then I think with hobbies, um, you know, this might mean that um, you're neglecting hobbies, interests, personal development in favor of professional success, which again can just lead to feelings of dissatisfaction with one's life or kind of reduced um, happiness. And then aligned with this, I, I really think that constantly striving for the next achievement can really lead to like perpetual dissatisfactions. The term toxic masculinity gets thrown around a lot. And I think often there's a defensiveness in thinking that it refers to masculinity in and of itself as being a toxic thing. But it's important to be clear in our terms that Usually, at least if it's being used in good faith, toxic masculinity is referring to specific ideals of masculinity that are mostly toxic for the people who have to adhere to them. And in a world where it is increasingly impossible to support a family on a single income, the idea that you are only truly a man if you are able to do so is, by and large, a very toxic idea. But it's so ingrained in us as a culture that a huge faction of men are completely intimidated by the idea of a female breadwinner. And there are consequences for women who don't subscribe to the norm in this way. According to a University of Chicago study, opposite sex marriages where the man is not the provider are 50% more likely to end in divorce. One study published in the Journal of Marriage and Family even found a link between men's stress at midlife and being financially dependent on a female breadwinner by measuring allostatic load, a physiological marker of chronic exposure to stress compared to household income by spouse. Interestingly, being economically dependent was not itself a marker of stress at midlife, but rather men's ideological beliefs. Quote, we found that economic dependency was associated with higher allostatic load for men who are espoused more traditional gender ideology. We found the opposite for the most egalitarian men. Economic dependency was associated with a lower level of allostatic load. In other words, men who think being a man means being a breadwinner are more likely to experience chronic stress and the health consequences that come with it than men who don't. And I can't move on without highlighting just one more statistic here, which is that men with high earning wives are also more likely to cheat. You see, ladies, they told us we could have it all. They got us into that workplace. They had us girl boss our way up to the C-suite. 
just so we can get cheated on. Quote, in fact, about 15% of the men in a study by the American Sociological Review who were 100% financially dependent on their wives had affairs. And that's three times higher than high earning wives who had the lowest cheating rates of any population. Cause they're too damn busy probably. Yeah, and they're also busy f***ing taking care of the house too because let's be clear, uh, and we've broken this down in other videos and we'll get to it in a future essay, but just because a woman is working full time, even being the breadwinner doesn't mean she is relieved from the expectation to basically do everything in the home. Because again, girls, we have it all. We got that briefcase in one hand, that cosmopolitan in the other. We're wearing stilettos. We're driving a luxury vehicle. We got a baby on one boob and a man on the other. <laughs> a husband is twice as likely to cheat if, if his wife makes more money than he does, um, which, which is just, it's uh, an outrageous number, right? Um, so the, the short answer there, and this is something that has been studied um, at great length now, uh, is self-esteem. That men are taught um, that their value, you know, as we hear from influencers all the time, is in providing and protecting. And so if you are not providing, then you are failing in some essential role. That simple explanation is um, men cheat to feel better about themselves. You know, how, how can they build that esteem back up? Well, I can't do it by being the principal bed breadwinner, either because I'm a stay-at-home dad or my profession just doesn't um, offer me those same opportunities. Uh, and we find destructive, self-destructive, uh, family-destructive ways then um, to go about feeling like a real man, um, which if that isn't the surest example of um, just how uh, truly awful um, our dominant modes of masculinity can be, that it leads people um, to blow up their lives because they don't make as much money as their partner. I, I can't think uh, of a better example of toxicity than that. So when it comes to the solutions that we are often offering men for how to support your family in a world where a single income isn't enough anymore, a lot of male targeted media and gurus and advice will basically just tell them to hustle themselves to death. And of course, when men are taught the message over and over that their ability to earn money is essential to their identity and the entire concept of being a man, they are going to be very likely to overwork themselves in a pursuit of that money. And a perfect example of this, at least as it pertains to the kind of messages being marketed to men on social media is the Sigma male. Quote, first coined by far-right activist and writer Theodore Robert Beale on a fringe nationalist blog in 2010, the Sigma male describes an introverted alpha male who likes to play by his own rules. Proliferated on 4chan forums and esoteric right-wing fitness circles, the Sigma mindset, or grind set, is associated with motivational speakers like Gary Vee. But its archaic views on masculinity paired with ample lashings of corporate cringe feel bafflingly extreme. In one so-called motivational video, Vaynerchuk asks an audience member to motivate themselves by imagining a relative getting shot in the face, while in another he goes in-depth on how hustle culture will make you rich. The content parodies itself. And self-parodying it may be, but the Sigma mindset has certainly found its audience. Gary Vee has 30 million followers across his social media channels. The, the whole Sigma male phenomenon, th they're interesting phenomenon because uh, I think what we've seen is um, a movement to more explicitly than ever, men seeking the approval of other men. So many of them seem to have simply convinced themselves that um, these ostentatious displays of wealth, um, what would otherwise look like clearly antisocial behavior, um, looks maxing, um, all of these things that, that are pushed in this subculture are very much appealing to uh, what other men say is value, trying to impress other men, win the approval and the applause of other men uh, with very little thought given to, you know, is this also appealing to women? Um, if I am lonely and single um, and ostensibly I don't want to be, um, at, at least, you know, when, when these men talk about things like male loneliness, it appears that they believe it is bad. Uh, then one would have to assume 
that they are looking to find a partner. And yet at no point are they asking women, um, what, what is it that you look for in a man? They are seeking almost exclusively the opinions of other men who, you know, in this wonderful twisted feedback loop, at, at no point does anyone seem to seek the, the advice of women. Um, I think that, that, that to me is the, the strangest part of this whole phenomenon, um, that at no point does anyone seem to actually be looking for advice from the person or the people uh, that they appear to be seeking the approval of. But that said, there's also been an interesting alternative to the hustle grind set that has been presented to men in the past decade or so, again, in light of an economy where it is increasingly impossible to support a family. And that is not hacking your ability to work more, but hacking your income. Tim Ferriss's The 4-Hour Workweek, aka How to Exploit Overseas Virtual Assistants So You Can Be a Digital Nomad Who Barely Has to Work, has sold millions of copies and is beloved by crypto bros everywhere. And while it does ostensibly put less of an emphasis on you you individually working more, I do think it ultimately represents just a slightly different side of the same coin. Either you work so much that your loved ones suffer from your absence, or you find a way to work very little by taking advantage of underpaid employees who aren't in a place to demand more. In both scenarios, your success and your ability to overcome an economy where wages have not even been remotely in line with the cost of living and inflation, the solutions are entirely individualistic and they're either exploiting yourself or exploiting someone else. You can deep dive into the content of basically any hustle slash work slash income hacking bro, and you will find essentially nothing that speaks to the actual policy problems that have led to this circumstance. The fact that, for example, we're at historical lows of union membership, something that used to be almost entirely populated by male workers and guaranteed, among other things, more competitive wages, time off, health care, retirements, pensions, etc., that doesn't make it into the conversation. But working extreme hours or outsourcing your entire life to the global south frequently does. In both scenarios though, your success is ultimately at someone's expense. Which brings us to our next chapter. Chapter 2. Be a man with all the force of a great typhoon. Among all the solutions we've been offering to men over the past few decades about their worsening economic and social situations, perhaps one of the most effective yet most simple has just been that they're not being manly enough. Because yes, things like life hacking or hustling or physical fitness and financial gamification, and we'll get into those in a bit, can be a part of the recipe. But for a certain strain of male fluencer, there's a pretty straightforward message of just be more of a man. Now, what it means to be a man, especially in a lot of the online and media spaces that are geared toward men, can vary. Because everyone's definition is going to be slightly different and there are cultural factors that impact it. But there are some consistencies in the be a more manly man messaging. And while I could speak at length about influencers like Andrew Tate, who have gone, I think, about as far as anyone could possibly go in the messaging of be more of a man, I actually don't even want to address him because I don't think he's a serious figure and I don't think people who follow him are serious people. And quite frankly, if you are already someone who has really bought into the Andrew Tate lifestyle of here are my 40 Lamborghinis and my 40 girlfriends that are being paid to hang out on a boat with me, um, let's blast cigars and drink scotch and uh, talk about how men aren't men anymore. I think you can just have that. Like, I don't think we're going to be able to meet common ground here. And you're probably also a fan of like Dan Bilzerian and his fraudulent poker career and fake girlfriends. I honestly look at manly figures like that as almost being like cartoon characters. But there has very clearly been a more mainstream version of the just man up crowd that appeals to a wider and in many ways more educated, more successful, and more politically diverse audience by not being quite so overt as the Andrew Tate beep beep get in bitch we're going trafficking. And what is so troubling in the popularity of these man up figures is just how much the be a man worldview reinforces the very same mental health norms that have been leading to disastrous social and emotional outcomes for men for 
for decades. Now, in this space full of bestsellers and viral TED Talks, you have figures like Ryan Holiday, who initially came to prominence as a guerrilla marketer for American Apparel, RIP, during their Dove Charney era. And in case you forgot what happened to Dove, I'll let you read the extensive termination section on his Wikipedia page. And Holiday once wrote a zeitgeisty book all about how he manipulated the media in service of the questionable brands he worked for. And you can read a roundup of some of his more notable lies in the article we've linked below. Since then, though, he has largely pivoted to a different and rather lucrative positioning as his own personal brand. Essentially, he's gone from marketing problematic brands to marketing his own life advice. Often styled as a modern-day philosopher king, his wheelhouse is that of stoicism, and many of his best-selling books and viral videos on the topic highlight its value as an ancient wisdom, tinging what is often pretty bog-standard self-help content with the affectations of academia and the weight of history. Now, as it pertains to the actual philosophy of Stoicism itself, there's a great breakdown on the channel Turtleneck Philosophy on why the actual messaging Holiday provides in his content is pretty diametrically opposed to the ideology of Stoicism. But what if I told you all of this is wrong? That Ryan Holiday's core philosophy isn't Stoic at all, but in fact, anti-Stoic. And more than that, it is existentialist. Welcome to the club. But when you look at the practical advice in much of his work, very clear themes start to emerge. Those of self-discipline, non-reactivity, and viewing the conditions you're in not just as self-evident, but in fact as a kind of gift in disguise, a challenge for you to rise to. And when we look at men's mental health, these same themes are some of the most frequently cited when it comes to the crises of loneliness, isolation, and lack of emotional connection. The material and economic conditions around American men continue to worsen, and our message to them becomes more and more one of, actually, it's a good thing that you're increasingly overworked and underpaid, unable to support a family, and through a total decimation of third spaces are forming fewer and fewer healthy connections. Those challenges are actually just a chance for you to prove your stoic manliness men's mental health issues are going undiagnosed, probably due to like the stigma associated with getting help and then the perceived, you know, um, weakness that would come from like those, again, what we've been talking about, right? That, that toxic masculinity. I think in a lot of ways, these narrow forms of masculinity that men are still being socialized into, um, they just don't leave much room for men to acknowledge, access, or even understand their feelings. So it makes it so they're unlikely to seek help, both based on expectations of male toughness and stigma, like we had just, like I had just mentioned. I also think, you know, to go back to the previous point, um, I think as human beings, we're hardwired for connection. And so we're not really meant to live alone. We're actually meant to be social beings. And so if you are living with these narrow forms of masculinity and you are experiencing loneliness, um, I think that that can have really lasting and damaging effects on a person's health. Um, mental health and health um, overall. And so that would go for men and women. But what we're seeing is that these trends of, you know, um, prevalence of, of mental health and health issues are, are actually happening um, among men and they're not they're not really getting that help that they need. It, it might suggest that personal shortcomings are solely um, solely due to like a lack of discipline or resilience, really overlooking systemic factors um, or mental health conditions that actually require different approaches. So I think that can be um, pretty problematic. I think oftentimes we see like stoicism um, as advocating for emotional control, but I think that can actually feed this loop of, you know, promoting emotional suppression, which is actually unhealthy. What, what is healthy is emotional expression. And so can obviously lead to um, lead men to feel kind of pressured to hide or, or, or ignore their emotions, which again, perpetuates this, these toxic um, and, and narrow views of kind of masculinity, which I, I think feeds into my next point is just like, it emphasizes these, these masculine virtues that are, that are patriarchal and <laughs> problematic in many ways. Um, and again, like reinforce these ideas that by valuing traits like stoicism and emotional stoicism that inherently, that are inherently, um, masculine, you're, you're, automatically kind of devaluing vulnerability and empathy. So it really does perpetuate these like rigid gender norms. And then again, I think based on, you know, um, be a man philosophy, it's really centered on a specific, sometimes narrow view of masculinity. And so it's really not accounting for different and, and varied perspectives of masculinity, um, particularly for those that do not fit into that neat traditional mold um, or those who face kind of unique challenges. So I think those are some of the um, kind of problems with it. This is not exclusively a new phenomenon. Um, it is something very old on steroids because we used to have a far greater willingness 
in the scripts of masculinity to value, for instance, um, the opinions of mothers, sisters. Um, there were trusted women in your social circle uh, whose opinions you were taught to value. And increasingly, um, all opinions of women are just shut out. Um, so not a totally new phenomenon, but certainly um, a, a more problematic one than ever. But if we're getting into the listen up buckoification of self-help, there is no way to have this conversation without mentioning the goat himself, one Jordan Peterson. Now, I assume that for most of us, JP needs no introduction, but in case you've been living under some kind of cult compound for the past decade, let me get you up to speed. Jordan is a massive best-selling author, professor, speaker, and former clinical psychologist who parlayed an initial wave of media attention around his resistance to a Canadian human rights bill that, among other things, would have codified the self-identification of trans people as part of a protected class into a full-fledged career as one of the world's foremost self-help gurus, traveling the world and making untold amounts of money selling his specific brand of mask advice to the hordes of young men looking for answers. And similar to Holiday, you'll see a lot of the same themes arise in his work, even if his branding is less ancient philosophy and more Judeo-Christian ethics. But his relationship to the actual nuts and bolts of religion, I recommend watching his debate with skeptic Matt Dillahunty to see him squirm under actual direct questioning about basic Christian beliefs, is similarly fluid to Holiday's relationship to philosophy. For both of them, they are branding devices and a tool to convey a more general message, that things were better for men before, and that the answer to those problems lies in the individual ability to solve for it. But if you scratch far enough beneath the surface of Jordan's work, you do start to see the mask slip every now and again. And his actual political views are pretty starkly conservative, no matter how he's tried to evade the question. And with each passing year, that distinction becomes a bit more overt. Here's one quote from a recent article he wrote for the National Post about the growing conservative movement in Canada. Quote, Conservatives, who tend to be conscientious, orderly, dutiful, and industrious by temperament, are also in consequence of that proclivity easily led to feel guilty. The woke narcissists, who on the other hand make up the progressive left, are characterized by an absolute lack of such conscience, but are expert at exploiting its presence in others. The be a man influencers do range, and there are clearly extremes in which they sort of exit polite society and rational conversation, and are more about like the bling and the bitch than anything else. But figures like Holiday or Peterson are massive international figures and bestsellers, and their messages aren't just about what makes a man, but about the kind of men who are even men to begin with. And above all, they have a starkly individualist perspective on the solutions to the challenges that men are facing in massive scale. If men are lonely, isolated, sick, underpaid, overworked, or simply without a healthy place in society, the answer is that they haven't bucked up quite enough or have failed to see the challenges around them as an opportunity for growth. Now, another way in which men are suffering undeniably is in their health outcomes. As we talked about in the intro, not only is their mental health been on a pretty steady decline over the past few decades, their physical health is suffering too, with their life expectancy dipping strikingly in the past few years. And while it's not unique to men to market the idea of health and fitness, there is a unique way of marketing those things that appeals to a very specific notion of masculinity. Put simply, the idea that to be a man means to be dominant over your physical form and to supersede its limitations in service of your goals. And that brings us to chapter three, the body and the mind, goop for men. So let's take it back to the Sigma male for a second, because as we've seen, being a man has just as many physical implications as it does behavioral ones. For one thing, men who buy into toxic rules of masculinity are absolutely obsessed with doing the most at the things that matter the least. Maybe this doesn't come across your feeds, in which case I envy the online experience you've curated for yourself. There was also my beloved man who ran basically the length of a marathon to and from work every day while his wife stayed home with the children and did the housework, which I'll just throw it to my own TikTok on the subject here because I stand by everything I said. Okay, I saw this TikTok and I knew I had to stitch it because I have something to say on this topic, but she has stitches turned off, which I hope is not because she's getting yelled at because she is absolutely right and she should say it. But anyway, she's talking about how men who are like extreme runners and uh, just kind of men's hobbies generally usually come at the expense of their wives when they have children and reinforce the already existing dynamic that women take on the vast majority of domestic labor and child rearing even when they also have full-time jobs. 
And that like in hetero couples with kids, like men are entitled to hobbies while women's hobbies are just like being a mother. But anyway, one of my Roman empires is this article I read a few years ago with like, I think it was like a prominent magazine editor or writer, some man anyway. And he was talking about how he ran like essentially a marathon distance every single day because he ran to and from his office from like Brooklyn to Midtown Manhattan. And in the article, it is mentioned that he had a wife and two children. And in my mind, I was just like, um, can we get an interview with the wife? Like, can we get an interview with the woman who essentially is like chained to your townhouse 24 seven so that you can run a marathon every single day? And like, at no point was that part of the conversation or any kind of consideration? Like the gist of the article was like, how impressive is this man who has this prestigious career and also manages to run a marathon every single day? And in my mind, I was like, yeah, you know what's even more impressive? His f***ing wife who has absolutely no life because of this. There's also the man who decided to run a marathon every day for a year with no rest days. And the entire Wikipedia article about ultra marathons, many of which take place in parts of the world that are inhospitable to human life. All of which sounds very chill and good for you and part of a balanced breakfast. Now listen, do individuals pursuing and achieving extreme and sometimes dangerous physical feats really matter at the individual level? No. If your thing is running 100 miles at a time in a desert with a heat index of 120 degrees, how about it, I guess? But when we look at examples of people pushing themselves to extreme physical duress under the name of self-improvement or self-mastery, the people doing it are almost always men. And when I say unhealthy, I really mean it, because actual professional athletes do not train in this way. Just using extreme running as an example, men keep pursuing these deranged goals regardless of what real scientific evidence tells us about the importance of rest days and the dangers of overtraining. And I think it's relevant to point out that while the more extreme examples of running a marathon every day, etc., usually only apply to men, women are also susceptible to falling for health trends based on pseudoscience. But for women, this is called wellness, and for men, it's called biohacking. And in general, for men, the pursuit of extremes in their physical or mental activities is viewed as not just a positive character trait and, again, a sign of self-mastery, but is inherently tied up with masculinity. One look no further than the many-time Joe Rogan guest and massive bestseller David Goggins. David Goggins, for those who aren't familiar, has become a bit of an icon of masculine persistence and determination. His story, going from being a bullied, out-of-shape loser, in his own words, to an absurdly fit ultramarathoner has racked up hundreds of millions of views across social media. His branding is usually something about being the toughest man alive or finding meaning in suffering, and his most popular interviews, such as the ones on Joe Rogan's podcast, podcast are often centered around the extreme nature of his self-discipline, the granular details of how far he pushes his body and mind, and other areas of pure endurance. One need only to scroll through the thumbnails of some of the videos about his story to see just how much this focus on toughness is an incredible exercise in branding. But this framing of biohacking, of not just being in harmony with your body, but being dominant over your body, also comes up in the treatment of mental health from these same male-targeted platforms and creators. And I would argue that the male obsession with extreme pursuits, whether they're physical or mental, is one of the reasons that biohacking and pseudoscience have found such a comfortable home amongst these facets of the population. And on the subject of dominating our minds and bodies, let's talk about Andrew Huberman. The Huberman Lab has been one of the most popular, if not the most most popular health podcasts for years now. And yet Andrew Huberman, a Stanford neuroscientist who has been credited with making people care about science again, was recently exposed for including misinformation in his content, among other things, including manipulating and lying to several female partners. In his podcast, he doesn't ever come out and tell his audience not to do certain things, like getting vaccinated, but instead espouses what he does, and because he is super jacked and super successful, his followers eat it up. Quote, Andrea Love, a microbiologist, immunologist, and science communicator herself, wrote a four-part newsletter series addressing Huberman's claims in greater detail. She says he promoted possibly using a sauna to improve immune function, citing a study that had just 20 participants and did not directly measure immune function. Love was also part of a cohort of scientists and public health communicators who raised concerns about Huberman's wildly popular podcast over several months. When Huberman had pediatric endocrinologist Robert Lustig on as a guest, these concerns grew louder. Lustig is perhaps best known for arguing that sugar, particularly fructose, is a toxin. 
Love, who said that Lustig's claims about the uniquely causal relationship between fructose and childhood obesity remain unproven, listened to the conversation between the two scientists. And as she listened, she took notes, marking moments where she felt the podcast omitted important facts, misinterpreted the progression of disease, or provided confusing information to listeners. At one point, Lustig cited a study that he said showed ultra-processed foods inhibited bone growth, one that, according to Huberman's exchange with Lustig, used human subjects in Israel to test its claims. Love tracked down the 2021 paper, and this was in vivo, in rodents, she wrote in her notes. Additionally, it was revealed that the Stanford lab Huberman is supposedly constantly working from barely exists, and he also lives 350 miles away from it. I think toxic masculinity often involves like adhering to these rigid and simplistic notions of gender roles and behavior. And I think misinformation can exploit this and reinforce these simplified views, you know, offering easy answers to complex um, questions. And I think this does align um, with the desire for clear definitive solutions that kind of toxic masculinity might promote. I think misinformation thrives in echo chambers where there's existing biases. Um, and so men who subscribe to toxic masculinity ideals, um, they may seek out and share information that actually confirm their views about gender roles. Um, strength, resilience, so contributing to the spread of that misinformation. I think also in terms of, you know, we've we've talked about this a little bit, but toxic masculinity, how it kind of discourages the, the vulnerability piece and, and encourages emotional suppression. I think misinformation can actually exploit these emotional states by providing content that really appeals to fears and securities and desires for control. So kind of manipulating people um, that may not feel comfortable expressing doubts or seeking alternative viewpoints. And then I think obviously there's financial incentives for promote, promoting controversial and sensational information. So particularly if it aligns with and amplifies toxic masculinity, I think this can drive influencers to kind of provide that for, um, to prioritize that for engagement and controversy kind of over accuracy. The connection between um, the manosphere of toxic masculinity and biohacking is, is a, it's a funny one because it's not obvious. It, it doesn't seem like there is a clear reason that they should be connected. And yet, um, any manfluencer with uh, following in the hundreds of thousands is almost certainly going to have an affiliate link where he is selling supplements or um, something, you know, crypto for that matter, something in of that type. Um, so there is obviously a connection there. Um, I think that, you know, part of it is, is philosophical. Um, so hacking, uh, being related to uh, that, that sort of idea that you have to be improving yourself, um, growing in some respect continuously. Um, if you're not getting bigger, if you're not getting healthier, whether or not they are getting healthier, um, th then you're moving backwards. You're being passed. Um, and it's, it's all a big competition. But Huberman is just one example of a man who has built an incredibly lucrative and prominent career, along with a bit of a cult following, by questioning scientific conventions under the guise of science. Now, this is not to say that any scientific study is above reproach or discussion, but exaggerating credentials, presenting incomplete information, or overstating the results of studies, especially, again, under the guise of science, creates a dangerous perception of legitimacy about what is often just a fairly speculative conversation between two dudes. This is why other creators who, for example, also have enormous male followings, like a Theo Vaughn, doesn't really make it into a video like this, because while he definitely has had some questionable stuff on his show, he is always going out of his way to present himself as a layperson who doesn't really know what's going on half the time, and from whom you should not be taking advice. But Huberman is worth mentioning as well, because one very notable aspect of his appeal is his physical appearance, which, as we mentioned before, consistently shows him being extraordinarily muscular, fit, and attractive, especially for his age. And when it comes to the physical challenge that are being presented to men as tenants of masculinity, it's impossible to decouple this phenomenon, as well as the framing of biohacking, which often mixes pseudoscience and physical fitness, 
and not talk about the male pursuit of being swole as hell. Now we've covered the toxic beauty and cosmetic industry and how it targets women, often to financially devastating results on this channel, but we haven't always explored as much how it impacts men. That said, we did a few years back do a video on celebrities and influencers gaslighting us about beauty and mention just how prevalent it's become for men in their 30s, 40s, 50s, and beyond to suddenly have physiques that would be considered difficult or impossible to attain, even by young men. Though perhaps what is most dangerous and insidious when it comes to these impossible and outright deceptive male beauty standards is the extent to which our superhero film obsession has made actors in their 40s and beyond maintaining the physiques of 25-year-old bodybuilders for years on end in order to star in these films nothing short of a phenomenon too. The proliferation of supplements and hormones and steroids that are marketed to men under the guise of health is Nothing new per se, but just like wellness culture can often rebrand things like disordered eating for women, biohacking culture and the pseudoscience that backs it up can often rebrand these things as something much more legitimate and even noble than they are to men. And it goes much further than just trying to build muscle. Quote, biohackers are known to implant computer chips, magnets, RFID tags, data transmitters, and other devices into their bodies, all in an attempt to make life easier and more seamless. Biohacking can be a slippery slope. Some types of biohacking, like using the concept of nutrigenomics to guide your eating habits, are generally safe. But other types, including most grinder biohacking practices, are not safe for most people, especially those attempting medical procedures or implantations without the help of a qualified professional. But if you've mastered your spiritual, your philosophical, your mental, and your physical manliness, we still have perhaps the biggest elephant in the room when it comes to what is being marketed to men as solution to their problems, and that's their wallets. Which brings us to chapter four, wealth hacking, MLMs for men. We've talked at length on this channel about the myriad pyramid schemes which target women and separate them from their money. And when you examine these MLMs, perhaps one of the most cynical aspects of their structure and continued success is how much they prey on unique aspects of women's psychology and socialization. For example, women tend to be underemployed, especially when they're new mothers or are married to someone in certain industries like military personnel. Women also tend to be much more social than men, maintaining more friendships, closer connections, and more frequent social outings. They also use social media more as a way to make consumer decisions and tend to trust word of mouth, both from actual relationships in their lives and from more parasocial relationships like favorite influencers they might follow. In short, much of the MLM model, spreading through social groups, relying on in-person connections, promising entrepreneurship to women who otherwise have a difficult time finding steady employment, is custom built to suck women specifically into their exploitation. Conversely though, the gamification of wealth, whether that's in real estate arbitrage, short-term rental empires, cryptocurrency, forex or day trading, or even in commodities like gold, are similarly predicated on understanding male psychology. But first and foremost, we must reiterate, as we mentioned earlier, just how tied up men's self-identity has historically been with their net worths. I think the pressure to be a financial provider can create significant stress and encourage toxic behavior in men in several ways. Um, I think both at home and in the workplace. So there may be some overlap with other things that we've already discussed, but I was thinking about this in, um, in four ways. <laughs> so um, the intense focus on financial success, I think can lead some men to adopt really aggressive and cutthroat behaviors to climb the corporate ladder. I think this might manifest as kind of an undermining of colleagues, engaging in unethical practices, becoming overly competitive, which I think does actually foster and perpetuate like this toxic um, work climate. I think the pressure to then fulfill the role of this primary breadwinner can sometimes also lead men to adopt this domineering and controlling attitude in their personal relationships as well. So that workplace aggression might then turn into domineering behavior at home. And so this might manifest in, you know, unilateral decision making without consulting their partners or expecting their partners to conform to more gen um, traditional gender roles. If you're really worried about, you know, meeting those financial expectations and being that sole um, primary um breadwinner, I think men are likely to then prioritize work above personal time that will foster then like this 
um, lack of work-life balance. And I think this then leads to burnout, straining and re- strain in relationships, maybe at work and at home. Um, and especially at home where, you know, that emotional presence and support are actually needed. And generally speaking, the more they associate their financial success with their self-identity, the worse it is for their mental health. Quote, in fact, placing central importance on materialistic values or financial aspirations has been linked to a host of negative outcomes, including lower self-esteem and life satisfaction, more anxiety, depressive symptoms, and physical health problems, and more maladaptive behaviors compared with placing relatively less importance on materialism or financial goals. So not just making enough money to sustain oneself, but enough money to be wealthy, or at least to support an entire family, something that increasingly requires being wealthy given our skyrocketing cost of living, is something that appeals to men's self-image. And keeping them in a worldview which prioritizes financial success, or at least the appearance of financial success, has long-term negative implications for their mental health. Essentially, in the same way that we will often sell women ideals of beauty that keep them spending money in the hopes of achieving it, and ultimately leave them less happy as they are sucked further into the never-ending pursuit of beauty ideals, there's a similar hamster wheel for men and the gamification of money. Just like MLMs, though, we have ample evidence that these get-rich-quick schemes that are consistently marketed to men are, at best, likely to not move the needle, and at worst, likely to destroy your finances. For example, crypto has been nothing short of a disaster for its average buyer, with around 80% of Bitcoin investors, and I use that term loosely, having lost money, according to one study. For short-term rental empires, the market is highly unpredictable, and the risk of being over-leveraged and carrying the mortgage on numerous properties you cannot consistently rent out is extremely high. Day trading, or really any kind of individual stock trading, has been consistently demonstrated to yield lower returns than simply investing in broadly diversified funds and not touching them for the longest time possible. And I could go on at length about the other schemes marketed to men to help them build wealth in the shortest time span possible, or by somehow outsmarting the system, another framing designed to appeal to men's self-identity, but I think we get the point. Ultimately, much of guru culture as it pertains to men is heavily intertwined with the goal of making money. And just like with an MLM, often the only people who are actually making money in these schemes are the people who are selling courses on how to do it yourself. Montage of men selling courses to other men. It's giving hey girl or whatever men say to each other when they open a DM. When we look at the landscape of the manosphere and the problems men are facing versus the solutions that are being offered to them for these problems, it becomes impossible to ignore just how much these solutions want to avoid any kind of economic reckoning. The message to men is clear. Don't change the system, just start getting better at the system. Start winning at the system. Become one of the rulers of the system. And in order to keep a population complacent about things like radically growing inequality, diminishing life expectancy, stagnant wages, a total erosion of things like retirement funds or healthcare systems, you have to convince them that they might one day be part of the winning class and that the winning class are what they should ultimately be aspiring to. Which brings us to our final chapter, Simping for Billionaires, The Manosphere's Endgame. When we tell men that they need to overcome basic needs for human connection and affection, to hide their vulnerabilities, and that they must get rich or die lest they not be a real man, they're naturally going to worship those that they see having clearly accomplished all of the above, the modern day billionaire. Now, according to the ideologies we've covered in this essay, billionaires are kind of the ubermensch, They're always hashtag rising and grinding. They're outsourcing quite a bit, and usually to people being paid pennies. They barely see their children. They're obsessed with biohacking their way into a younger, fitter, more muscular body, and are also getting not-so-discreet hair transplants. I'll say Jeff Bezos better than Elon Musk because he's rocking that Lex Luthor look. Like, he's not dashing off to Turkey every couple weeks to go get, you know, the hairline touched up. We see you, Elon. Photos don't lie. For example, Elon Musk, founder of multiple household name tech companies and father of I can't keep track of how many but dad to none, is the perfect example of a real man by these standards, dedicating his life to work first and foremost, and exploiting a specific market only for personal gain. He founded Tesla, arguably the foremost manufacturer of electric vehicles with the most confusing door handles, leading one to believe he may actually care about climate change and the future of the environment. Though we're not even going to get into this now, but the environmental benefits of an expanded rail network would massively outweigh a widespread shift to electronic vehicles, but let's put that aside. And yet his recent pledge to personally donate $45 million a month to the Trump campaign super PAC, a campaign that wants to shatter what little strides we've made in an effort to combat climate change, shocked absolutely no one. 
Musk isn't in the EV game for the world's benefit, he's in it for his own. And men who are told that you're only out for yourself in this world absolutely eat that shit up. And actually, I am going to say one last thing about the rail thing. I would just recommend that you Google the Hyperloop, the dumbest thing that this country has ever invested any resources into. Um, that's a really high bar to clear. And just understand that it was never intended to work or to be used at scale. It was just there to thwart the attempt to increase high speed rail in these areas. But anyway, may that man never know peace because I will never know peace in a high-speed rail in this country. But conservative ideology, and make no mistake, the vast majority of content that is geared towards men about their problems is conservative at its most fundamental level. But the fact that conservative ideology exploits men's insecurities around wealth, power, being the provider, and being a real man, trademark, copyright, R. <laughs> Now, when it comes to identifying with billionaires more than the people who we are much closer to economically as sort of a psychological coping mechanism, few examples are more relevant in recent history than the rise and enduring popularity of Donald Trump. Now, we go into a much deeper dive on Trump and how he fits into this whole phenomenon in the members-only version of this video, which you can get by hitting the join button or clicking the link down below in the description box. But suffice it to say, for basically as long as there's been in America, there has been a serious addiction to feeling closer to the wealthiest people than to the people with whom we actually have class solidarity. And so much of what is marketed to men is tied up in this idea that they too can one day hope to be rich. And because of this obsession with billionaires in the grind set, we have, you might have guessed it, millions of men voting against their own interests. Take, for example, the marginal tax rate changes proposed under Project 2025, which just looking at it from a tax perspective alone, this would create just two marginal tax brackets, 15 and 30%. This would substantially raise taxes for the working class, considering any individual earning under $44,725 a year currently has a marginal tax rate of 12% or less, while simultaneously lowering taxes for the upper classes. But who really needs a break? A working class single mom who's struggling to get food on the table, or a finance bro who only got into Cornell because his family donated a million dollars. Trump's plan to offset revenue lost from federal income taxes is to impose tariffs, a half-baked idea at best, and we'll link you to an article below about how the math is really not mathing there. And listen, I want to be very clear. I hate the Democratic Party as a whole. I think it's ridiculous that these are the only two choices we have. Like, there are very few people in the Democratic Party that I would consider to be progressive enough economically especially, and I'm certainly not trying to say that their platform is unilaterally better for men, but take basically any number of issues. Things like healthcare, retirement, veterans benefits, the minimum wage, working in middle class taxes job protections, union protections, and it's undeniable that the Democrats, while not offering a perfect or even really great plan, are certainly offering a better one. But the conservative ideology, and make no mistake, almost all of the Manosphere content that is heavily marketed toward men is very conservative in nature, both from its pretty gender essentialist views about the role of men and the role of women, and its hyper-individualist perspectives on the necessary changes for these systemic problems. If you break it down, you will see that conservative at its core preys on men believing that they will one day be part of this privileged class. The truth is, most men in America are not rich. In fact, statistically, most men in America can't support a family of four on their income. They have much less in common with a wealthy podcaster or best-selling author or billionaire politician or CEO than they do with a woman who happens to also be middle or working class. I think the, the simple answer to the question, why are young men more likely to be politically conservative than young women, um, is that conservatism, um, not even necessarily as a political ideology, um, but just as a, a, a general philosophy, um, means preserving the, the social structure as it exists today, if not restoring those that we used to find value in in, in the past. Uh, and so many of those uh, are, are fundamentally patriarchal. You know, looking at, at something like um, medical regulations, anti-abortion um, legislation, uh, where you know, still um, the majority of politicians, judges, doctors who are involved in the decision-making processes there tend to be men. Um, so we're talking about, uh, in a very basic sense, um, men having power over women's bodies, over women's choices. 
Uh, and so the conservatism of men, even if, if we just look at this as a, a very simple question of um, self-interest, um, it makes sense that women would be operating in their own self-interest and move toward um, left-wing politics and liberalism that increases their freedoms, that gives them more power um, over their bodies and their choices, and that men, um, seeing that they are losing those powers, uh, may then be drawn to politics and policies that help them hold on to it. Um, and I, I would say, you know, to, to get a little, um, a, a little less granular, a um, little less focused on things like legislation, um, you know, uh, conservatism also tends to celebrate those values and attitudes that we associate with masculinity. Um, things like strength, stoicism, competition, um, and devalue those values and attitudes that we code as feminine, associate with women. Um, so empathy, social justice, equity. Um, so again, if we have boys who are being raised, um, you know, being exposed to toxically masculine ideas, and then they see similar ideas being expressed in conservative politics, it also makes a lot of sense to me then that, that they, they would make that connection and see, oh, these, these are people, this is a movement um, that values the same things that I do, just, just in the abstract. Masculinity and men in general are undeniably in a crisis. But what's scarier to me is the solutions being offered to them because not only do they not work at scale, I mean, just look at the crypto meltdown. That was almost entirely men. And while a few men did end up making money, the vast majority of them were just men who lost. But these quote unquote solutions also often push them further and further into ideologies about what it means to be a man that got them in trouble in the first place. Men don't need to view every problem facing them as a chance for them to get even more jack, whether that is physically muscular jacked or spiritually jacked. They don't need to work for jobs in order to have the pride of supporting a family. They don't need to tamp down their emotions or run a hundred miles a day so they're too tired to experience emotions because they shouldn't be in this position in the first place. The idea of, of being masculine, uh, masculinity on the whole, uh, hurts men all the time and, and it hurts us by design. Um, if masculinity is, is working correctly, it is, it is going to hurt at least some of the men all of the time. Um, first of all, because masculinity is an incredibly narrow set of prescribed behaviors and actions. Nobody can meet uh, the masculine ideal all the time. You know, even, even the most masculine man is, is going to have um, days where he falls short, days where um, you know, where, where, he, where he loses, he fails, he, he is sad, he is emotional, um, happens to all of us. And, and then we're punished for it. You know, whether we are punished because we have internalized a sense of masculinity that doesn't allow us to feel sad, um, or that has convinced us that we are lesser if we have failed, uh, or he is punished by other men, in some cases, other women, um, who have learned to value masculinity and, um, you know, to, just to look at somebody like Donald Trump as an exemplar here, um, you can't lose. If you have lost, then you have to invent an entire mythology uh, about how that happened and you did in fact win. Um, and, and look now when we have audio, we have a recording that came out recently where he admits that he lost in 2020 um, and suddenly, several of his followers uh, are experiencing an existential crisis because how could he have lost? Um, and, and masculinity is is to blame for much of that. Um, and masculinity is also uh, the another reason that that it unavoidably hurts people is that it is nearly always treated as a finite resource. Um, how do I acquire masculinity? I acquire it. By taking it from somebody else. You know, it's set up um, as if we are constantly in competition. It's a fight for more masculine virtue. Um, even the language of alpha 
you know, implies that there, there is somebody at the top. They had to knock somebody out of the alpha position in order to take it. We can't have too many alphas or, you know, the, the language ceases to have meaning. And that, that fight, that battle to be the top dog uh, is always going to carry, you know, physical, mental, emotional costs too. Um, so there, there is no question masculinity um, would not work if it wasn't constantly hurting men. Often when people are looking to explain why things have gotten bad for men and for the nuclear family, they will point to things like women being promiscuous or there being too many gay people or violence in media, although strangely never people owning guns. But the one thing we don't really point to when we look at what many of these speakers would consider to be the golden age of masculinity, times like just after World War II in the United States, is all of the ways in which our political and economic policies were set up to help create a healthy middle class that could live on one income. Things like, for example, the GI Bill, which definitely favored white veterans and came at the expense of non-white ones, but were very clearly a tool to create middle-class wealth and stability. Or the fact that the marginal tax rate back during the time of Eisenhower was over 90% at the highest levels. Or the fact that it was wildly more common to be a part of a union, or to have a pension, or that wages were pegged to inflation. That madman image of the man coming home from a job and taking off his hat and kissing his beautiful wife and tussling his kid's hair and, I don't know, throwing a tennis ball to the golden retriever or whatever the hell was happening in those houses, it's not gone because women are twerking. It's gone because no one but the wealthiest Americans can afford to do that anymore. And the more we spend our time selling this hyper-masculine snake oil to the many men who are rightfully angry and looking for answers, the longer it will take us to get a little bit of class solidarity going in the chat and start working towards solutions that will allow us not just to be men again, but to be people again. As always, guys, thank you for watching, and I will see you back here next month on an all-new video essay. Ciao!